Yeah, you would think. Um, why don't we have a word of prayer as we begin? Let's bow our heads together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath day. Thank you for this place where we can gather. And thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to uh, worship you, to fellowship together, to spend this Sabbath rest in contemplation of the things that you've done for us and in, in your presence, Lord. I just pray that you would guide and, and bless us as we uh, study your word, as we uh, worship and sing, and, and as our children's departments meet, Father. Uh, God, I just pray that this would be a, a special time. Uh, we invite your Holy Spirit to guide us and bless us. Thank you, Lord, so much that we can, uh, that we can be here. We pray in Jesus' name. Well, if you have your quarterly or uh, if you want to, to follow along with us, we are in lesson number five, which starts on page 38. This is all uh, dedicated to the idea of what it means to rest in Christ. And so there's been a variety of topics along that theme. Um, I found this quarterly not to necessarily be a chronological. It's more of a topical uh, evaluation of, of different ways in which the Bible um talks about rest in Christ. So on page 38, we, we come to the memory text, which I always like us to, to read um, to begin with. And this is one that we should be very familiar with if we have been in the church for any length of time. It comes from Matthew 11 and verse 28. In the New King James Version, it says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To me, this is just about one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. It just is filled with hope and promise and richness. There's very few of us that don't relate with that idea of labor and being heavy laden. I mean, even if life is good, right? Even if we're comfortable, even if we're surrounded with blessings, in this fallen world, we experience the strain and stress and brokenness and... Um, um, that promise of Jesus that if we come to him, he will give us rest. Um, it, it is uh, uh, relevant and applicable to all of us and um, a, a beautiful promise of Jesus. I don't know how many of you uh, read the uh, opening of the lesson where the principal authors kind of introduce the lesson on page two. Um, I, I, I took a glance at that and, and am uh, always enjoying to hear kind of the the background of what the authors are, are trying to uh, present in the lesson. And they began it with a story, uh, a parable, you might say, of uh, uh, people on a plane. And I don't know why it happens so often that planes uh, and air travel gives us so many great stories. But uh, it was a story of a, of a plane, and they're going through a storm. And the pilots had gotten on the intercom and said, everyone, you better hang tight. Uh, just so you know, we're going to be hitting a storm, and there's a lot of turbulence. And, and uh, it says, as they went through, the plane is bouncing, and the bins are opening. And, of course, I've been on planes where there's turbulence, and you, you, know, you get a little white-knuckled, and you start, well, you know, this was a bad storm, and people started kind of really, uh, there was a shout in the back. It really dramatizes the situation. But one of the passengers happened to notice, he looked uh, toward the front of the plane, and there was a little girl. It, 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 in in the uh, seating, nice to see you, Nick. Welcome. Um, and she was not afraid. And the the plane would bump and lurch, and and she had these uh, the tray down, and she had crayons, and she would bump and lurch, and you know just go back to her drawing. And and so they make it through the storm, and uh, everyone's kind of oh, relieved, and they land, and everyone's getting off the plane. And the guy who saw the girl wanted to ask her. So as they're getting off the plane, he said. I noticed that during the storm, you didn't seem frightened. Didn't that storm scare you? And she said, well, no. You see, my dad's the pilot, and I knew he would get us through. And that's kind of the punchline, right? Uh, when you know who your pilot is, and you love your pilot, and your pilot has proven themselves capable of getting you through the storm, what then have we to fear, right? That's the story. And I, I like that analogy. I've heard it told in different ways, but I hadn't seen it in that way. Isn't that like what Jesus is to us? Isn't he our pilot or our leader, 
our general, our, our father, what, however those talks. And, and he has proven himself that though we will go through the storm, he has the ability to keep us safe and save us through the storm. And that kind of relates to this memory text. Why does Jesus invite us to come to him? Why, when we come to him, can we trust that he is able to relieve us of this burden and give us rest? Well, it has to do with our ability to trust that Jesus is able to um, follow through on what he has promised. So in Sunday's lesson, it wants us to look at the context of where this verse comes from, and, and that's always a good thing to do. And uh, if you look at the broader context of Matthew 11, Jesus has just um, um, identified the problem of unrepentant cities. Okay, Beginning in verse 20, he, he references... Uh, the Bible references that he did many miracles in some of these other cities, and yet these cities did not trust him. They did not repent. They did not turn to him. So it's within this context that Jesus then turns to his disciples and begins to give uh, this lesson on his love and his ability to save. And so you have to remember that the context of this passage, come unto me, all ye who are uh, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, is in the context of unrepentance, right? And I, I, I think that's a very helpful. This isn't just simply a general thing to, the, to people who are just floating through life, right? This is a specific invitation to people who've heard the opportunity to be saved in Jesus Christ. And they have made the conscious decision to resist that or to deny it or to doubt it, okay? That context, I think, is very important. This is a message to everyone who knows what Jesus has said and promised, and yet the devil is tr working on their heart to resist that. And Jesus is trying to pierce through that hesitancy and make this invitation. Um, in the middle, uh, kind of toward the bottom, I underlined one of the sentences here that caught me. And, and I, I don't know how you read this, but let me read it to you, and you tell me if this makes sense. Before... We can come to unload our burdens. We need to understand that we cannot carry them alone. Now, this, 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 this sentence can mean different things. And it, it, it interested me when I first read it because it didn't make sense. What does that mean? Before we can come to unload our burdens, we need to understand that we cannot carry them alone. What does that mean? And do you agree with it? Before we can come to unload our burdens, we need to understand that we cannot carry them alone. All right. So you're saying, you know, it should be fairly self-evident. Yet human nature and the fallenness of our nature uh, deceives us. And we are, especially men, we don't like to ask for help. We don't like to ask for directions. We don't like to follow the instructions. <laughs> Right? I mean, these are stereotypes. I understand that. But I think this is a, a challenge. With A lot of us like to say, I can do it. It's not that bad. I can handle it. I appreciate the offer, Lord. And, and you, know, I'll, you know, I'll take you up on, on some of it maybe, but I got this. Nick. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of how can you give someone something that you yourself don't possess? Sure, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I see where you're going with that. There's, there's. When I first read this sentence, it confused me because it made it sound like uh, before we can unload our burdens, we need to understand that we cannot carry them alone. It made it sound like what Jesus wants to do is help us carry our burdens. We cannot carry them alone. We need someone to help us carry our burdens. 
Now, here's a very important theological question. Does Jesus want to help us carry our burdens, or does he want to rid us of our burdens? Now, this is a, this is a significant question that different denominations and, and historically have argued about. Does Jesus want to help us? Or does Jesus want to save us? Okay? Does Jesus want to help us with our, help us overcome? Or does Jesus overcome for us? Okay? This will this will uh, this will be developed a little bit more um, in the lesson. Um, toward in the bottom, I, I usually like these little questions at the bottom. Uh, is asked, what burdens are you carrying? And this kind of goes back to the. Um, the, the previous one of uh, we need to understand that we cannot carry them alone. Some people don't acknowledge that they have a burden at all. They've become so numb that they don't even realize. It's almost like an addict who refuses to admit they're an addict. And even though they're dying a little bit every day through their addiction, they still live in that denial. Well, that's what sin does to us. Sin rears itself in our lives where if we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of our situation, we deny or, or become numb to the reality or become deluded even. The Bible will talk about a delusion that comes over us. Um, and we see this and you say, oh yeah, worldly people all the time. This happens in the church a lot. People that don't realize that their life is dominated by pride. They think they're the most humble person in the world, but they just have this spirit of arrogance and pride. Or people that think, I'm not gossiping. I'm just telling people the truth. I'm just informing people. And they don't realize that these sinful um, powers are dominating their life. So um, that's why, by the way, that's why we have things like the Sabbath and rest. This isn't just simply about laying back and saying, what a wonderful thing God's done for me. But it's an opportunity for us to come before God and say, reveal to me uh, the areas of my life that I'm still struggling with. And, um, and, and the Lord is, is a gracious God that wants to, to do that for us. How can you learn to give them to Jesus, these burdens, and experience the rest he offers at so great a cost to himself? How can you learn to give your burdens to Jesus? Yes. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. So come is in the imperative, and it's an idea of surrendering our control. Yeah. Nick. It's a good point. There's two differences to historically how uh, the, and this is going to get in, into the lesson. Biblically, the Jews understood the idea of a yoke or a burden as the law. That's what they, when they heard the idea of yoke or being yoked or uh, uh, carrying a burden to a Jew, uh, the rabbis taught that's the law. The law is the yoke. The law is the burden that we carry. It is the realization of the uh, expectation of God that on our own we can never meet. That's the burden, the expectation of God. Christianity comes along and it turns the idea of burden slightly and it says that the burden and the yoke is guilt. Now these are two sides of the same coin. Okay? It's but in Christianity the burden that we carry is the guilt of the realization of the law. So it's not a huge difference, but just in semantical terms, um, that means a difference. So um, it's kind of a both and, as I would say. If you understand your guilt in, in responsibility to murder, well, that's the burden. But if you understand your guilt in the domination of a, of a vice in your life, uh, coveting, lying, gossip, pride, or whatever, 
it, it, it accomplishes the same thing. It's, your, it's, your, it's the realization that you stand before God condemned. You stand before, whether because of your understanding of the law uh, uh, and, and the expectations of the law, and um, it, from a Christian context, your guilt before God because of the law. Um, I pulled out my copy, Pilgrim's Progress. Are you, are you familiar with this book at all? Um, it, it's just a dynamic, you know, what is it, 300 years old now, I think? I think it was written in the 1600s. Oh, late 1600s, so it's almost 350 years old now. Um, you know, I take good care of it. This is not my original, but it's one I came across and have used. And, you know, the whole analogy of pilgrim or Christian is the, the pack he carries, remember? He, he carries this burden. And, and from the very beginning, on, on the very first page, um, as Bunyan describes this allegory, he says, I walked through the wilderness of the world. I lighted on a certain place where there was a den. I laid down in that place to sleep, and I slept. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed in rags, standing in a certain place with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. I mean, the very the beginning of the book is all about this book that he's holding. What's the book? The book's the Bible, right? The book is the Bible, and what's the pack? What's the pack that he's carrying? It's his sin. It's his guilt. It's his understanding. Along in the story, he comes across these different characters. One is called Help. One is called uh, Pliable. Um, one is the Evangelist. I mean, there's just a, a wonderful array of, of characters. But he, he meets a character by the name of World. Now, do you think World's a good guy or a bad guy? <laughs> Biblically, the world represents, you know, a bad guy, right? And World asks him, how did you come to get this pack on your back? Do you remember what pli or pliable? You remember what Christian's answer was? He said, "By reading this book, by reading this book." What did he mean by that? Why is it that by reading the message of God, the law of God, the Bible, it places a, a large burden upon our back? What's that? Okay. Hello. Hi, Jody. Gotcha. I think that's good. Bob. Okay. Absolutely. If if this does place a burden on people, why do we ask people to read it? Why don't we just let them enjoy their burdenless life and, and be blissful? Okay. Yes. So another example from English literature, um, um, you know the story of uh, the Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge. Okay, do you remember when he's visited by his former business partner, Jacob Marley, and he's got chains all around him. He's just chains and weights carried on. And Scrooge says, where do these come from? He says, I forged these in life. And he says, I carry them now. And your chain that you're carrying now is ten times what this chain. And Scrooge says, I don't see anything. He says, whether you recognize them or not, they're there. Now, we believe that this book tells us that there is a chain around all of us, whether we recognize it or not. Or to use a more modern analogy, there's a disease, a 
cancer that we all carry, whether we notice it or not. And yet, it doesn't just tell us there's a chain or a burden or a disease. It provides the solution to that. If you knew that someone you loved had a deadly disease, wouldn't you want them to, web, and they, but they didn't know it, wouldn't you want them to know about it so that they could get healed? Even if it hurt their feelings? It wasn't meant to be a trick question. Ultimately, it, this does reveal to us the truth. And the truth, while making us aware of our brokenness and fallenness and guilt before God, Ultimately, the Bible says the truth will set us free. So I just want to uh, finish this the, the analogy from Bunyan. One of the, my favorite parts of the book is when he loses the burden. And it comes as he's approaching the celestial city. Um, and he has, he's already gone to Sinai. And the weight of the pack got heavier on Sinai. But now he comes to a new mountain. He ran thus to a place um, that is somewhat ascending. And upon that place stood a cross. And a little below in the bottom, a sepulcher. So I saw in my dream that just as Christian came up upon the cross, his burden loosed from his shoulders, fell from his back, and began to tumble. And so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the sepulcher where it fell in, and I saw it no more. And Christian even sings a little song. Thus far I did come laden with my sin, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in. Till I came hither, what place is this? Must here be the beginning of my bliss? Must here be the burden fall from my back? Must here the strings that bound it to me crack? Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher, blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. So does Jesus want to help us with the burden or does Jesus want to rid us of the burden? He wants to rid us of the burden. And by the way, this is what separates Protestantism from Catholicism. This is the great theological divide. Um, Protestantism teaches that Jesus wants to remove our sin. Um, Catholicism says that Jesus just helps us with our sin. I've studied this at the master's level. I have, a, I, I have the catechism, so um, uh, that was the, the issue between Luther and the church. So this is, this is coming out of Wednesday's lesson. Oh, excuse me, I, I skipped Monday and Tuesday, didn't I? Didn't. Come to Monday's lesson. Yeah. Um, this is, again, from that passage in Matthew 11. And ask the question, why does Jesus command us to take his yoke? And this is another idea that Jesus doesn't want to help us with our burden. He wants to take away our burden because if we're still carrying our burden, how are we going to take his yoke upon us if we still have our own yoke there? Okay. So that, that is, uh, that's made evident in the passage itself. Why does Jesus command us to take his yoke right after he has invited us to give him our burdens and find true, true rest? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's the connectedness to someone who is uh, capable to do what we cannot do for ourselves. I like that. Very good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. The thought came to me was the concept of purpose as well. Um, Jesus doesn't want to just rid us of our burden, of our yoke, of our guilt. He wants us to be filled with the purity and truth and purpose that he wants us to have in our life. He doesn't just want to save us. Um, I, I think... Um, Nick, you, you were saying earlier, um, once, once we come to a, the realization of what our burden is and, and what Jesus has done for us, our obligation then is to teach others that, right? And, and what we can't give it to others if we don't have it ourselves, right? 
So if Jesus wants to loosen and rid us of that pack, right, um, he wants us to walk in the purpose of helping others do that. We can only do that if we're walking with him and following his ways. So for me, this idea of taking on his yoke and being connected with him and allowing him to do the, the heavy lifting and, and all that is also this idea that as we do that, we find that we have a, uh, a calling, a, 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 a purpose to uh, help others with that. In the middle of, of, the, uh, of the section here, I, I saw it too. While the yoke is a symbol of submission, it is also a metaphor illustrating united purpose. We submit to his yoke, as you talked about, submission, and accept the task he has given us to bless those around us. We're not carrying his yoke. We are just yoked to him because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I thought that was nicely put in, in the lesson. I, I like that. We are not carrying his yoke. We are yoked to him because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And we have, we accept the task that he gives us in, in united purpose. What happens if we don't accept that yoke? What happens when we come to Jesus and we say, I love what you're promising. I don't want this guilt. I don't want this uh, uh, addiction or whatever it is. Thank you very much. What happens if after that we remain unyoked from him? We just walk through life unburdened and unyoked and we're we're doing fine. I was thinking the same thing. Yep. God comes and drives out the evil, but if we don't uh, replace that uh, vacuum with goodness, with the Holy Spirit, then we just make ourselves open to get right back into the same situation we are. Or, or worse. Very good. Yeah. So um, if that's the case, how do, we, uh, assure, how do we live in assurance and confidence? that we are uh, walking yoked with the Lord? How do we know that we have accepted his yoke and we are um, uh, following that purpose and that task that he's given us? How do we know that? There you go, another good analogy. So um, a person comes to the Lord and they, they, they take the invitation. They've been unrepentant at first. Remember, the context is unrepentant. So this is, this is a category of people who've heard the gospel. They've heard the truth. They've struggled with it. They've rejected. They've hesitated. But they, they later in life, they come to the point of saying, yes, I want that. They come to Jesus, and they say, I want that rest. They, they, the burden is released. They, they yoke up with Jesus. And, and then uh, from that point on, they never have to worry about being burdened again. Is that how it works? What what's the raspberry for? <laughs> okay, straighten us out then. Love gives you freedom of people that have a heavy disease, and they've got the church praying for them, and their family praying for them, and they know they're going to get healed, and it doesn't happen. You know, Christ has promised to help us with our problems and our issues. I didn't have the verse written down. I was just looking for it. Um, I think both Matthew and Luke say it, where Jesus says, He who desires to come after me, so Jesus said, Come unto me, right? He who desires to come after me must pick up his cross. How often? 
daily and follow me. Right? What is that cross? Self-sacrifice. Right? Isn't that what that cross is? Self-sacrifice. Not allowing self to be in control, but submitting to the Father. What did Jesus do on the cross? He did not put his priorities first. He submitted to the will of the Father. And through his sacrifice, salvation came to others. When we're yoked to Jesus, we follow his example. We follow his task. We do not pursue the things that build up ourselves. We do those things that build up others in accordance to the will of the Father so that it can bring salvation to others. But how often did Jesus say we need to follow after him? Once a, He said once a year, right? He would desire to take up his cross about once every decade. And you're going to be fine. Is that what the Bible says? How often should we come unto Jesus? Oh, the Sabbath, once a week. That's how often we come to That's wonderful. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Psalm 42, verse 8. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. I delight in your law. Um, when I was young, uh, toddler even, four or five years old, um, we lived uh, on a very busy street in, in the yard that I played in front of, just across the sidewalk, pretty busy street, a lot of traffic. <clears throat> so my parents had a, a law, and that law was you cannot play in the street. Does that sound reasonable to you? If you were a parent, would you want your 17-month-old? Okay. Now... As a four- and five-year-old, I didn't like that law. I wanted to play, and I had balls that I would throw. I had uh, cars, and I especially liked destroying those cars. And one of the best ways you could destroy those cars was leaving them in the street. <laughs> now, as an infant, as a child, I may have thought that law was a burden. That law was a hassle. That law was unjust. That law prevented me from living my life to the fullest in my immature mind. But from the perspective of my parents, was that law a beautiful thing? That law meant salvation. <laughs> that law meant preventing harm from coming. And so I think that's when, when David says, I delight in your law. Look at the ruin he brought into his life. And that was last week's study, right? When he violated the law. Okay, he slept with Bathsheba, impregnates her, murders Uriah, lies. He's breaking law after law after law after law. And what did it bring to him? Heartbreak and ruin and, and, and terrible results because he did not delight in the law. So uh, that, that, is, uh, that is very true. When we understand the true nature of the law, um, yes, we are guilty before the law, but it drives us to Jesus who, who saves us. Okay, uh, Bottom, oh, we're still on Monday. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson because I, I want to get a little further. There's, there's so many wonderful things. Um, Jesus says in this passage, and learn from me. Okay, learn from me, he says. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then notice what he says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Does it strike you as interesting that the very first thing Jesus identifies as uh, his character, he says, learn from me, I am, and you think of all the I am's that God is, he could have said, oh, I am righteous, I am sovereign, right? I am love, okay? I am truth. Think of all the things that Jesus could have said at that moment. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am. And he chooses to identify himself in this context. I am 
gentle and lowly in heart. Why? Of all the things that Jesus could have said, I am merciful, right? I am the sacrifice, you know, just whew, all these things. Why did Jesus say, when you come to me, when you're unrepentant, but then the Holy Spirit works on your heart and you respond to that imperative to come to Jesus and he loosens that pack, rolls it off your shoulders, and he, 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 you accept his yoke upon your shoulders and you begin to walk in, in, in unity and oneness with him. And he said, now that we're together, I want you to learn from me. And the very first thing he says is, I am gentle. Why did he choose that? It's the opposite of the other emotion. Very good. What is it that got that burden on us in the first place, right? It was selfishness and sin. It was the opposite of gentle. It was uh, the opposite of being humble. Uh, I think that's well said, Bob. Pride, self-sufficiency, um, uh, the uh, you know just uh, placing our own self first and, and, and not realizing or even sometimes realizing how much it hurts others. Arrogance. What does it mean to be gentle and lowly in heart? Okay. Doesn't mean you're a doormat. Well, what does it mean then? <laughs> Welcoming? So I'll give you a, another uh, analogy that I think um, came to my mind as I was contemplating this. A friend of mine, I didn't uh, experience this myself, but a friend of mine did. He said he went to someone's house, and when he went in to use the restroom, um, he, he sat down, but he turned around, uh, he, he closed the door, turned around and sat down to use the restroom, and he, when he looked up on the door, there was a big poster. And the poster said, there are, true, there are two undeniable truths. One, there is a God. Two, you're not it. And it was, he said it was uh, an interesting position to be, uh, to be uh, reading that statement. Okay? I want you to think about that for a second. There are two undeniable truths. There is a God, and two, you are not it. What was, the, what was the original sin? What was the original burden? What did Lucifer do in heaven? What was his argument? I will be like God. I will ascend to the uttermost of the holy mountain. I, right? What did Satan tempt Eve with in the garden? You will be like God, right? This is, this, is the, this is the issue. To take God off his throne and say that's, you know, you've got all these good things, that's fine, but I don't need you. I can do fine without you. As a matter of fact, I can do better than you. To me, gentleness and humility and meekness is understanding who God is in your life and understanding who you are before God. When you understand who you are before God, you will be gentle, and you will be humble, and you will be meek. Nick. I have
don't do it. Yeah, totally. Yep. Good. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And when you think about the description of of the the sacrifice of Jesus in Philippians 2, it, I think it, it illustrates also the attitude, and it gives you the same idea. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul borrows very similar language in Philippians 2. He says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, learn from Jesus, right? And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 11, learn from me. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he is God, did not regard equality with God as something to be held on to or grasped, but emptied himself. What is that? What do we call that? Humility, right? Submission, gentleness. And taking the form of a servant, a bond servant, being made in the likeness of men. Now think about that contrast. Satan says to Eve, you'll be like God. And Satan wanted to be like God. But what did Jesus do? He became like us. You talk about the opposite, Bob, which he said earlier. It's just totally the reverse. The attitude of God was to become like us to save us. The attitude of Satan was to try to become like God to throw to overthrow God. You have, you know, power and, and obstinance and arrogance versus humility and condescension and lowliness. These these two uh, 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 paradoxes are are just fascinating to me. Jesus desired to become like us so that we could become like him. Whereas sin says you need to become like uh, you need to become like God to bring God down so that you can be above God. So, very, very interesting. All right, we have uh, a couple minutes left. My yoke, uh, we'll go to uh, uh, Wednesday. My yoke is easy. We don't have, a, we don't have a, the entire period to... to uh, spend on this but what in the world is jesus talking about there my yoke is easy what does that even mean do you think that the the christian martyrs that were being burned at the stake were just like man this is easy not a problem and and the, the waldensians hiding out in caves and and uh, all the the history of persecution or even just the the the, the daily struggle of resisting the the power of sin in our life is that easy what does it mean, my yoke is easy? Do we sometimes uh, uh, convince ourselves or try to convince others, oh, if you become a Christian, life will become so easy for you? Is that What, what does that mean? What, what does this mean? Have you thought about that? What does it mean, my yoke is easy? Okay, so does easy mean what we often think of as easy as being not complex, as being, uh, you know, simple, or does it mean something else? As as uh, as Rob mentioned here, that it like it's not always easy, but it's good. Right. Right. And it's amazing how we sometimes slip into this so so easily. <laughs> um, you know, we're supposed to follow Jesus and live his example. Did Jesus have an easy life? I mean, from the moment he's born, he's trying to be killed. Right? His own followers are wanting to throw him off a cliff. His own disciples, you know, doubt him at times and abandon him in a time of need. Did Jesus have it easy? No. Did the oh, okay, so Jesus took the hard parts for us. So that, so that those who follow after him, they can have it easy. Oh, okay. Did the disciples have it easy? Well, let me see. I read the book of Acts. Uh, James is beheaded. Peter goes into prison several times. Uh, Paul is beaten, and, and you know he goes through the sea and uh, you know almost drowned and shipwrecked and gets bitten by serpents. So is the promise of God that the Christian life will be easy? What does that mean? It obviously doesn't mean without trial. It obviously doesn't mean without persecution. (laughs) 
okay, straighten us out. Okay. <laughs> Right, true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think that's that's something we we is very true, and we we need to understand this in the light of. Of, of scripture, but I come back to this, the story that, that the lesson began with, and I talked about earlier about the little girl on the plane, right? Did she go through the storm? Yeah, she went through the storm. Everyone on the plane went through the storm. They went through the same storm, but who had an easy time of it? The one who knew that the pilot was her father that loved her and had the ability to get her through. She still went through it. Her little body was bounced in the turbulence, okay? She heard the, uh, the shuffling of the luggage and all that. Okay, so she experienced the same terror, the same potential and all those trials, but because she knew who the pilot was, it was an easy thing for her to endure. And for me, that is just kind of, we will go through the trials of life. We will be persecuted. We will struggle with, with vanity and, and, and vices and, and all kinds of things. But when we know who is our God, and when we know what he's done for us and the sacrifice that he's made, and he's able to fulfill his promise, we will experience those trials with a greater sense of ease than those who lack that promise and assurance. Does that work for you? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the wise builder and the foolish builder. One builds on the rock, one builds on the sand. The storm comes to both of them, right? The storm Building on the rock doesn't mean the storm doesn't come, right? The storm still comes, but one house stands and one house falls. I'd rather be in the house that stands. Yeah, I like it. Dwight, Leah, nice to see you. We're just going to have a word of prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that we can come and be here today. Thank you for this discussion and opportunity to look at this uh, beautiful, beautiful promise. And, Lord, continue to enrich us with its truest meaning and depth. And, Lord, we will give you all the praise. Be with the service today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much. Enjoyed talking with you and studying together.